Hello, hello everybody, hello. Good to see you all. I just wanna make sure everything is working okay. Hello, hello. Yes, I should have the regular chat on everyone. So, hello Deborah. good to see you. Welcome in, welcome in. Hello, hello, hello. Good to see everybody. Yay, <laughs> welcome back everybody. <laughs> Glad you're here. Hello, hello, hello. Good to see you. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Yes, so everybody, today should be pretty fun. <laughs> I came on just a little bit early. I know we've had some problems with um, our notifications, so thought I would come on a little early to give everybody a chance to come on in. So. Yes, my voice is uh, feeling much better. I just have to uh, make sure I'm timing myself just right. So as long as I'm careful with the timing, I should be okay, everybody. So yes, from the dark side. <laughs> no, not the dark side. <laughs> oh my goodness. How is it Thursday, everybody, this week? Oh, I just don't even know. Did you hear the news out of Missouri? Oh, Steffi, I'm not sure. I've heard lots of news uh, going on. There was a case in Florida where we had a verdict that came out. We had um, several things, but yeah, no, you'll have to tell me. You'll have to tell me. I'm just wondering now. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Vote for whomever you want, everybody. <laughs> it's up to you, just as long as you're voting. Yeah, what's out of Missouri? You've piqued our interest now. <laughs> they canceled it. They canceled what's been canceled in Missouri? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, Minneapolis. Oh, oh, my goodness. There are a lot of M states. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was like, they canceled the state of Missouri? What? <laughs> oh, Stephanie, no, that's so funny. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Yes, yes. So they have uh, dismissed the case for the primaries. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, Steffi. Oh my gosh. Yes, yes. I don't know. Missouri is, uh, you know, pretty, pretty red state. It's now part of Wisconsin. <laughs> oh my goodness. It is a pretty red state. If memory serves, <laughs> yes, yes, Minnesota, yes. The Supreme Court uh, did hear arguments uh, not too long ago, just last week, but then I uh, went ahead and dismissed the case right now, stating, you know what, we're going to need to wait. Um, we're going to need to wait. So, <laughs> so that turned out okay. I think it's just a... The, uh, an interesting way that their law is written that they have the parties choose the candidates for the primaries. So I think that's really the key. Small blue dot. <laughs> well, stay safe in your dot, in your area of dotness. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Coco. I mean, I don't know. I think... Uh, I think it's a really great opportunity to figure out that language in the 14th Amendment. You know, whichever way, whichever, however it turns out, I think, you know, some clarification on that section of the 14th would be excellent. So um, I'm glad to see that. It would be something else if one of the major party nominees was... It really would be, David. It really would be. Uh, there's uh, There's a lot to... There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of really good issues going on. So we will have to see what happens. Hello, Matt. It's good to see you. Welcome on in. No, I just came on. I just came on. I came on a little bit early tonight to just make sure everybody had a chance to come in before I started going through um, everything tonight. Yes, I started just a bit early to give everybody a chance to come on in and hang out. Um, I know the notifications haven't been working that great recently. So did you see the, my, I did Sarah. Oh my gosh. Wow. You know, 
verdicts that size are so rare. They really are, uh, but in this case, so warranted. It's just, oh my gosh, the case is heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. Thank you. Yes, this is one of my fall rings. Um, I'm trying to get, uh, I have just a few fall rings that I like to bring out. And then we'll switch over to winter. <laughs> the winter rings. Doesn't everybody? Is that weird? <laughs> is that, oh my gosh. Oh, from Tennessee. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome on in. Welcome in. Good to see you. Yes, the more the time change. I, I understand. Absolutely. I absolutely understand. <laughs> What's the Maya case? Right. So uh, there was a civil case in Florida involving John um, Hopkins. And there was a little girl who was sick. And the way that they treated her mother ultimately led to the mother committing um, self you know, things. So the family sued and the verdict came back for the family today. So wrongful death situation. Very sad, very, very sad situation. Unaliving. Yes. Thank you, Steffi. So children's, yes, it was their, they're responsible. They were um, putting a lot of the blame of this, you know, sick child onto the mother saying that there was Munchin sins involved and there wasn't and so it was really really a sad sad situation the testimony has been really sad the whole thing is just an awful situation but yeah 221 million dollar verdict of course they will appeal i have no doubt but when you get a verdict that size it's going to include punitive damages and punitive damages are when you get those huge huge verdicts and it serves to punish whoever the wrongdoer is. So the jury came back and said, not only are you responsible, but you screwed up so bad, we're giving you punitive damages. So do you change your nails every day? No, no, um, I don't, T. Uh, it depends. It depends. Um, I did change these. I had blue on for several days, but it did change today. Um, I really, whenever I'm going to play guitar honestly i take off my nails <laughs> and so then i need a new set although sometimes i can just be cutting vegetables and i'll have to get a new set oh, is the child okay yes well i mean you know as okay as you can be without having a parent anymore so do you use a hand filter i don't <laughs> oh my goodness oh my goodness no 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 <laughs> I, uh, it actually is kind of difficult. I try to work really hard to get the filters off when I'm going live. So <laughs> there's no filter, on. but maybe, I mean, there might be one that I don't know about, but yes, I have a bowl of nails. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, everybody. That's so funny. Have insurance to cover verdicts like that. You know, there's usually a cap actually. So I don't know how far their cap goes, but I would be surprised if their insurance would cover a cap that high. Um, I would be surprised, but it's absolutely possible. Um, in this situation, one of the reasons punitive damages can be so high is so that it will exceed insurance to some degree. So yeah, it's a very interesting case. Uh, again, very rare to have that high of a level of um, damages found, but you know, again, it's a... It's a pretty sad case, so. I have lots of tea tonight, everybody, so I'm good to go. I'm very excited about that. Doesn't, in, doesn't cover punitive, really, Erica? Ooh, that's even, ooh, that's, yeah, because I'm sure a huge chunk of that is the punitive. Wow, that would be a huge, huge hit. Yeah, I'm glad too, Sarah. I'm I'm glad too. So, well, welcome on in, everybody. Welcome in. Good to see you all. I'm starting off with just showing you that we do have a motion to extend discovery for Mr. Clark, and this is out of the Georgia case. I thought this was interesting. Um, oh, thank you, Amy. Yes, I've got my <laughs> I've got my cow nails. I love cows. Anytime I feel stressed. If I look at a cow, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> and my stress is just done. So <laughs> I appreciate it. 
Oh my gosh, Amanda, yes, the strike. The strike has ended officially. I mean, I, I guess there's a tentative agreement, but I'm feeling um, very excited for everybody. I'm so glad that happened. So that was wonderful news today. Very, very wonderful. We were excited. So I do have, um, yes, they are. They're extremely sensitive. I, I don't know. Do cows make good pets? I just don't know if they do or not. I wish. I wish I could have a cow, but I can't. I can't have a cow. I'm not zoned. <laughs> I'm not zoned for a cow. But, oh my gosh, I adore cows. I just absolutely do. <laughs> I do. Yes, we had a writer's strike and an actor's strike. Uh, the writer's strike had ended, but we had an actor's strike that was still going on. So now they have just ended. Yes, yes, I do. They have dwarf cows. Yes, I know. I know, I do. I love cows. I can't. I just, oh my gosh, they're just amazing. I love them. You have how many? Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Yeah, no, I don't eat cows. I don't eat cows and I don't drink cow milk. <laughs> Not that I'm judging anybody that does. It's just for me personally. I don't. But yes, I do. An emotional support cow. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh my gosh. Oh, you have a dairy farm. Oh my gosh. Matt, wow, working hard. That's hard work. Yeah, no, I don't I don't eat beef. <laughs> oh my gosh. Although I'm not judging anybody. I just for me, I just don't eat beef. <laughs> oh well, thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, thank you. Okay, well, good to see everybody. Good to see you all. So I did want to let you know, tonight we are going to be focusing on Judge Cannon, all right? We're definitely going to be talking about her, federal judges, whether or not, you know, she could be asked to recuse herself. And then I'm also going to be going through the Court of Appeals that reversed her. So I'll be going through that. But I wanted to start by letting you know that we had a motion to extend discovery and motion deadlines filed by uh, Jeffrey Clark out of Georgia. So he's one of the remaining defendants. Oh my gosh, yes, oh, dairy farms. Whew, so much work, so much work. So what's really interesting here is that he's saying, he's saying because the District of Columbia uh, has filed disciplinary charges against him back in July of 2022, um, he's asking for, and it's for the same conduct, he's asking for an extension of time. So discovery is initially set for December 4th and then January 8th. And so he's asking for those dates to be moved. So we have, um, I just thought I would share this with you. He had sought dismissal of the charges in the highest court in District of Columbia, but the court declined to rule. So he's asking then, I think this is really interesting to have um, this kind of breakdown of what's going on in the cases. So at present between the 11th Circuit Removal Appeal, so he's still on appeal trying to get his case moved into federal court out of Georgia. The D.C. Circuit Removal Appeal, both of which removal appeals uh, possesses a right, blah, 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 blah in order to appeal and has the following plethora of deadlines over the next two months. So these are Mr. Clark's deadline. Why would that be George's problem? That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. So let's take a look and see what we've got going on. So we have a deadline to request additional hearing days set for the DC bar. He's got his reply in support of a stay for his 11th circuit. Then he's also got two more deadlines for the DC bar. So a Zoom hearing, the deadline to request it, the deadline to meet and confer for his law license, uh, an exchange of witness lists for his law license, uh, for his appeal, his brief is due on the 20th. Now in Fulton County here, his reply to support personal jurisdiction motion, um, again, in order to try to uh, you know bump his case to federal court, so he still has this. Coming up, he's got objections to witness list, pre-hearing motions for his law license. And this is just over the next couple of weeks. And then Thanksgiving, because of course you have to include Thanksgiving, because that's important. <laughs> you have to include that. 
So again, I always think it's interesting when we can see what someone's calendar looks like, especially someone with so many different cases going on. So his law license here, he's got responses to pre-hearing motions due on the 28th, a discovery due here in Fulton County on the 4th of December. Then for his bar, his license, he has to designate expert witnesses, his appeal, his brief is due, objections to expert witnesses, exhibit list, and objections to authenticity of, of exhibits. These are all due for his law license. Then the district attorney's appellee brief uh, is due in the 11th Circuit. I don't know what that has to do with him. That's his brief. Uh, district attorney's, um, oh wait, here on the 20th, stipulations of fact for his law license, rebuttal of expert designations also due. Then he's written in Christmas and New Year's. And then a deadline for a motion to continue for his law license, his appeal out of D.C., uh, the D.C. Bar's appellee brief is, it's like he thinks that he's a busy lawyer, but he's a busy defendant. Exactly, Amanda. Exactly. That's exactly right. Like, this is, this is on him. He's appealing, trying to get into federal court for these cases. He's fighting for his law license, but, you know, there's a reason. There's a reason why this is happening here. Uh, all right, so the bar's appellee brief is due, and then the pretrial motions in Fulton County are due on the 8th. We have our first hearing day for his law license. His reply brief is due on the 10th for the 11th Circuit. He's got hearings then for his law license here, so two weeks, and then his reply brief for his appeal out of the uh, D.C. case is here, and then the D.C. bar has a day to exchange exhibits. Then we have the D.C. Circuit deferred appendix and final briefs due as well. So it's a busy calendar, but, you know, I mean, that's what happens when you, when you, you know, get charged with stuff. <laughs> and when you do stuff that could put your law license in jeopardy, you know, you have to fight, you have to fight it. So many attorneys losing their licenses. Absolutely. They really are. They really are. So let me get the chart, everybody. I'm giving you a warning here. Warning, prepare yourself. <laughs> prepare yourself for the chart. So <laughs> here's the chart. This will be the true showing if all the filters are off. There shouldn't be any filters on. <laughs> so this is Jeffrey Clark. So the person filing this motion for, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> oh my goodness. So the one filing for the motions here is Jeffrey Clark. All right, he was the environmental attorney in the Department of Justice who was saying that, who Trump was essentially saying he was going to appoint as the AG, and the entire Justice Department said, we will all resign if you do that. So, wanted to use the Insurrection Act, exactly VC, yes, that's exactly it. So, he um, his law license is absolutely under fire, and for good reason, absolutely good reason. So just to give you an idea, each of the uh, people that have a blue triangle are attorneys. So if we look through this chart, we've got Clark here. We have Chile. Uh, Eastman was also an attorney. Giuliani, he's lost his license. Smith is an attorney. Jenna Ellis, an attorney. And then Ms. Powell's an attorney. Cheese bros and attorneys. So there are a lot of attorneys that were involved in this, and they are just one at a time being called out. No, you have to have your law license to be uh, appointed as AG. Yeah, you've got to have your law license. Great question, though. But yeah, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight attorneys. That's a lot. That's a lot of attorneys. All innocent patriots, thanks, Justice Thomas. <laughs> so funny. Oh, my goodness. So, yes. Yeah, so, this was um, Jeffrey Clark. Again, he's the one trying to remove his case out of Georgia into federal court. He's appealing. Uh, he's also got his D.C. bar review going on right now. They're going after his law license, and he's appealing that as well. So, very, very busy man. And so, that's why he's saying he wants um, to extend... He wants an extension for his motions so that he can have more time. I'm not going to read through this because it just, it's not, it's not worth the time, honestly. 
Uh, but I thought it was interesting to take a look at his uh, schedule because he's he's a busy man right now. He's absolutely busy. So, yeah, no point. Not really, not really. So here's our calendar, everybody. I'm bringing it back. Um, I was out on the 7th here, but we did go yesterday. It was, <laughs> it was a bit of a journey, but we made it. We did our sub chat only. Uh, and went through the Avanka uh, hearing. So that was kind of fun for yesterday. I also did do, uh, I was on YouTube for a little while and I'm thinking I might do one night a week and do a live stream on YouTube because that really is fun and I've forgotten how much fun that was. So I think I'll probably do that. I'll figure that out. And then how big of a guilty for Trump so much? It's gonna have to fit the picture, right? So, <laughs> cause it fits the whole box. So it'll have to fit the whole picture. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, I think YouTube is very fun, everybody. So I'm thinking um, I might move my sub chat only to uh, the weekend cows and cannon. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so funny. So I think I might move my sub chat only uh, to the weekend. I don't know, everybody. Let, let me know. My subscribers, let me know if that would work for you. And then start doing a Wednesdays on YouTube then just to kind of go and hang out over there for a while. It is really fun over there. Uh, it's fun here too. Don't get me wrong, everybody, but it's fun. <laughs> so we'll see. But uh, so I'll probably start hopping over once a week to YouTube. And then, of course, once a week, we'll be having our sub chat. But tonight for everyone's uh, fun, we're gonna go through, or at least for my fun, at least it's fun for me, uh, we're going to go through Judge Cannon. So Judge Cannon is the judge who is, yes, will you have, oh wait, 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 I just missed it. Will you have multi guilty for Trump? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> So yes, I can live stream um, over on YouTube. I have enough followers over there. It's just a much more calm. The chat's quite a bit different. It's it's a bit more calm. It's not quite as lively, but sometimes that's okay too. And some of my more controversial um, things that I think have a harder time getting through the algorithm here might be easier over there. So I had started doing that a couple months ago, but then kind of had had a few problems, but I think I might go back over again one night a week uh, and do that because that was really fun. Anytime my life here goes down or if it's not working, I will be over there. So we'll see what happens. We'll see. So everybody, tonight I wanted to kind of explain how uh, Judge Cannon has been involved. Now, Judge Cannon is the judge who is presiding over the uh, documents case out of Florida right now. And they get another judge who's competent. Well, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. Oh, absolutely. Make time for myself. Absolutely. Um, because I need to be a little bit more protective of my voice, I'm not going to be able to go quite as long on my live. So um, I think that will just have to kind of be part of it. Um, I'll go a little bit sh shorter. Yes. <laughs> All right, all right. So here, here we go, everybody. Let me show you the rule first. Let's let's get into the rule, and then I'll take you through the case that she was overruled on in Florida. So, if the one way to truly get a judge off of a case is to ask them for a recusal, if there's not an ethics violation or some kind of a um, huge violation that they've done that would have them disciplined by uh, their for their law license or being a judge. The only way to truly get a judge off of a case is to ask them to recuse themselves. So if there is some kind of, um, you know, huge abuse of power or issue going on, you can appeal and have them uh, requested to be removed. But those are very rare situations. It is possible. So, yes, hot tea and honey. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So in order for a judge to be pulled or for them to be asked, you would use what we call a recusal motion. And this is under uh, the Code of Federal Regulations for our federal judges. So she is a federal judge uh, in the uh, court in Florida. So there are a few reasons. First, we've got a discretionary recusal. 
So a judge can recuse themselves from a proceeding whenever the judge deems it appropriate. So the judge can recuse themselves. A mandatory recusal. A judge shall recuse himself under circumstances that would require disqualification of a federal judge under Canon 3C of the Code of Conduct for the United States judges, except that the required recusal may be set aside under the conditions specified by Canon D. Now, canons are our ethical rules. So these are the rules regarding any kind of conflicts of interest um, and those kinds of things. So if there are any ethical violations, they have to recuse themselves. Uh, in this situation, hello from Texas. Hello, hello. Uh, next, we've got C, which is the request for recusal. Now, what I did for tonight, after I go through the appellate's case reversing her, I will go through also uh, Judge Chutkin was requested to recuse herself by Mr. Trump in the D.C. case. So I'll kind of show you those examples. But you can request, any party can request that the judge at any time following the judge's designation and before the filing of a decision be recused under paragraph A or B of this section or both by filing with the judge promptly upon the discovery of the alleged facts and affidavit setting forth in detail the matters alleged to constitute grounds for recusal. So either party can request that the judge recuse themselves. Oh, tea break. <laughs> Yes, uh, Judge Chutkin's incredibly smart. Yes, uh, she is. And, you know, I'm not saying Judge Cannon isn't. They're just two different judges for sure. Next, we've got uh, Section D, a ruling on the request. If the judge finds that the request for recusal has been filed with due diligence and that the material filed in support of the request establishes the recusal either is appropriate under paragraph A um, or B, the judge shall recuse themselves from the proceeding. If the judge denies a request for recusal, the judge shall issue a ruling on the record stating the grounds for denying the request, shall proceed with the hearing, or if the hearing has closed, proceed with the issuance of the decision under provision 2200.90. So that's the process in order to ask a judge to recuse themselves. And again, I will go through after I go through this Court of Appeals opinion and explain the motion for recusal, then we have the government's response in the DC case, then we have Trump's reply, and then we have the judge's order. So I'll take you through all of those, um, all of those different pieces. So, but let's let's get into what happened in DC, everybody. I'm sure, or not DC, I'm sorry, in Florida. I'm sure everyone's heard, you know, that Judge Cannon had been reversed, right? So they said, okay, she was a Trump appointee, she screwed up, she messed up, and was appealed. But a lot of people, I don't think, really realize that um, what what actually happened in that situation. So that's really what I want to start talking about is giving you the details of what really happened, so you can kind of figure out for yourself um, how out of line she was, or if she was out of line, or if she just made a mistake. So this is the docket for the appeal, and it started August 22nd of 2022. The original complaint was filed by Donald Trump, and this has to do with the warrant that was received, uh, the FBI received in order to go into Mar-a-Lago. So all of this has to do with the documents. Now, the uh, appellate court does a really great job of breaking down the facts, so I will read you through those facts because I think they're absolutely fascinating. But basically, he sued trying to get the warrant uh, to not be issued and an injunction so that any of the documents they found in his home couldn't be used against him. So he filed a lawsuit. So I will take you through that docket. But first, let's go through what happened in the Court of Appeals, everybody. Yes, the documents case, the documents case. Okay, all right, so um, this, whole, this whole case is set, oh, thank you, Lisa. This whole case is set out very well. Uh, again, this is a lawsuit. Mr. Trump is against the United States of America regarding the warrant. And I'll just walk you through what has happened here, all right? So, Keep in mind, the district court, Judge Cannon, had originally been involved. There was a warrant that had been issued, and then Donald Trump had requested a special master to come in and watch out for like his 
golf shirts and his pictures of Celine Dion. And so he's like, we need a special master to make sure the government's not, you know, messing with my stuff. So Judge Cannon said, okay, and appointed that special master. And then <laughs> all heck broke out and this appeal occurred. So the issue here on appeal is whether or not there was jurisdiction for Judge Cannon to grant this special master and she also had put into place a freeze on all the evidence that the government had already collected. So she froze it and she said, you can't use it. So you can't go forward with the criminal proceeding, which paused everything. And so, of course, the government um, appealed that. So they appealed her holding uh, regarding the special master, but mostly regarding them not being able to use the evidence they had already gathered from the warrant. So that's where we're starting off here. All right, let me grab my sweet. Let's see, grab my pen for tonight. Okay, so sticky note. Yes, yes, thank you, Deborah. Oh my goodness. No, I can't forget the sticky note. How did that even happen? That was so close. That was a close one, Deb. <laughs> All right, so this is, what should we call this one? We'll call this the Court of Appeals, Court of Appeals against Judge Cannon. All right, and then this was in 2022. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, again, the facts are set out pretty well. They, they did a really great job with the opinion. So you can kind of let me know what you think. If the uh, court held properly or, you know, or exactly how things went down. So, all right. Here we go, everybody. So we're before, um, again, we're in front of the circuit court. So we've got a three court. Wait. Yep, three court judges involved is per, per curiam, which means from the bench. We don't know who actually wrote the opinion. It's one of these judges. So this is the Florida case. Yeah, should I put that on here? We'll put Florida on here. Florida. There we go. All right, there's my atrocious handwriting. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Here we go. So this appeal requires us to consider whether the district court had jurisdiction to block the United States from using lawfully seized records in a criminal investigation. The answer is no. So that's the legal question in the case. Did, did Judge Cannon have the authority to put a pause on the evidence they had already gathered? So let's get into it. Uh, we're going to, again, go through the procedural history and then we'll go into the facts. Former President Donald J. Trump brought a civil action seeking an injunction against the government after it executed a search warrant at his Mar-a-Lago residence. He argues that a court-mandated special master review process is necessary because the government's privilege review team protocols were inadequate. And they'll go in and explain what this team is a little bit more in just a little bit. So, hold on everybody, I gotta switch pens. <laughs> My pen, what? I'm having a pen issue. All right, here we go. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, all right, all right. Uh, all right, so. Um, were inadequate because various seized documents are protected by executive or attorney-client privilege because he could have declassified documents or designated them as personal rather than presidential records. And if all that fails, so they're saying if all of his arguments fail there, he's saying because the government's appeal was procedurally deficient, the government disagrees with each contention. So, <laughs> oh my goodness, this is actually a very, very well-written decision. So these legal disputes ignore one fundamental question, whether the district court, so Judge Cannon, had the power to hear the case. And then here's the case law that they're using. 
After all, federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction, and that's what's set out in Article 3 of the Constitution. They possess only that power authorized by the Constitution and statute, which is not to be expanded by judicial decree. So that's the precedent keys. So here we go. This case was such an expansion, meaning they felt that Judge Cannon took her role as a judge too far. So she's not supposed to expand her role under the case law, and they felt that she did. Exercises of equitable jurisdiction, which the district court invoked here, should be exceptional and anomalous. So the discretion she used in order to halt the usage of what they found for the search warrant was too much. It's very rare when you're allowed to use that kind of power. And they said this was not a situation where she should have used that power. We have a four-part test under the Ritchie case, and the court will go into that. So we've got four factors, and they said here, plaintiff, which is Mr. Trump, his arguments fail all four of the factors regarding whether or not there was jurisdiction. In considering these arguments, we are faced with a choice. Apply our usual test, drastically expand the availability of equitable jurisdiction for every subject of a search warrant. That would be a lot of work. Or, <laughs> again, so apply our usual test, which again would be normal, or drastically expand it, or carve out an unprecedented exception in our law for former presidents, we choose the first option. So we've got three options here. We can do what we normally do, we can drastically expand what we normally do, or we can make a special rule just for presidents. And they're saying, we're just gonna do what we normally do. So <laughs> I think that's fair. So the case should be dismissed. <laughs> so that's their holding there. So let's start walking through the facts, everybody. I won't read through the entire case, but I will take you through the facts because I think they're absolutely fascinating. I didn't know all of this, actually. Uh, and I've read through this multiple times. So here we go. Keep in mind, the plaintiff here is Mr. Trump, all right? So I know we're kind of flipped around because this is a civil case, but he is the plaintiff. As plaintiff's presidential term drew to a close in January of 2021, Movers transferred documents from the White House to his personal residence, a South Florida resort and club known as Mar-a-Lago. Over the course of that year and into the next, inconsistent with its responsibilities under the Presidential Records Act, the National Archives and Records Administration sought to obtain missing presidential records that its officials believed were in the plaintiff's possession. So the court's going to slowly walk us through here what happened. Now, in case you're wondering my color scheme, I always use green for facts. And then the yellow here is just citing the documents that they're pulling their facts out of, in case you're curious. The government first sought the voluntary return of the records. In January of 2022, after months of discussions, plaintiff transferred 15 boxes of documents to the National Archives. Inside were newspapers, magazines, printed news articles, photos, miscellaneous printouts, notes, presidential correspondence, personal and post-presidential records, and a lot of classified records. <laughs> and, and a lot of classified <laughs> records. Whoops, <laughs> that, not supposed to have that. <laughs> The Department of Justice was alerted about the classified materials in February of 2022. It then sought access to the 15 boxes so that the FBI and others in the intelligence community could examine them to access important national security interests, including the potential damage resulting from the apparent manner in which these materials were stored. The National Archives later advised the plaintiff that it planned to provide the FBI access to the records in roughly one week. When he requested a delay, when Trump requested a delay of up to 11 days, the National Archives agreed. All right, so National Archives, so NARA noticed out of these 15 boxes, there were classified documents. They told Mr. Trump they were going to show it to the FBI in a week. He said, can you give me 11 days? They said, fine, just to keep everyone up to date here. When the new deadline deadline arrived to show the records to the FBI in April of 2022, 
Uh, Trump requested yet another extension. He also informed NARA that if it declined to grant his extension, he would make a protective assertion of executive privilege over the documents. So he said, I want more time before you show the FBI. And if you don't give me more time, I'm going to file that I've got executive privilege protections. The National Archives rejected that assertion as unviable, saying the question in this case is not a close one. And informed plaintiffs, so Mr. Trump's attorney's representative, that it would give F the FBI access to the records. Plaintiff did not follow through with any effort to block the FBI's review of the documents. So the FBI did finally, was able to go through those original 15 boxes and take a look at the documents. So the FBI reviewed the records in mid-May, more than three months after it first learned that classified documents had been stored at Mar-a-Lago. It found 184 documents marked at varying levels of classification, including 25 marked top secret. Now, again, as a friendly reminder, um, every document that has one of three different labels on it as a classified document, there's um, three different levels. It doesn't matter what level it is, you're, all, you're charged the same. If it's one of those three categories, including top secret, you can get charged with that. So that's, that's how the documents were pled out in the indictment in Florida. In the meantime, the FBI had developed evidence that even more classified information likely remained at the plaintiff's residence. Oop, tea break. <clears throat> okay, so they figured there was more evidence. The Department of Justice obtained a grand jury subpoena. Now, we're going to be talking about two different things. We have a subpoena and we have a warrant. So the first thing we have here is a subpoena. Uh, for all documents or writings bearing classification markings that were in the plaintiff's custody, so Trump's custody or control, and the plaintiff's counsel was served with the subpoena in early May. So subpoena is a court order requesting someone to do something. All right, so that's what the subpoena is for. They're saying you need to give us all of the documents labeled with a classification marking on it. All right. The plaintiff did not assert claims of privilege or declassification in response to the subpoena, but he did seek more time to produce the requested documents. And the government eventually extended the compliance deadline to June 7th of 2022. A few days before the deadline was set to expire, plaintiff's representatives produced an envelope. Now, many of you may remember this from the indictment reading where his attorney had figured out that some of the documents were so classified that the attorney tried to protect them. So that's the envelope they're talking about here. Produced an envelope wrapped in tape, which was consistent with an effort to comply with handling procedures for classified documents. It contained 38 classified documents, 17 of which were marked top secret. A declaration accompanying the document certified that a diligent search was conducted of the boxes moved from the White House and that any and all responsive documents had now been produced. So this declaration is one of the counts for lying uh, that has been charged in the Florida documents case. Because they, they said, here you go, this is it, this is all, this is all the stuff we have, and they put this declaration out. So keep that in mind. It is a lot. It is a lot, everybody. <laughs> so we had 38 more classified documents. So first we have 184. Now we have an additional 38, along with a declaration that apparently that was all of it. Even so... The FBI developed more evidence that other classified documents remained at Mar-a-Lago. In August of 2022, over one and a half years after the end of the plaintiff's presidential administration, six months after the first transfer of boxes to the National Archives, and three months after the subpoena was served, the Department of Justice sought a search warrant. All right, so first we had a subpoena. Now we've got a search warrant. All right, again, two different legal standards. A search warrant has to be based off of probable cause, and that's how people can, or that the government can come into your home and look for stuff. 
It presented an FBI agent sworn affidavit to a Florida magistrate judge who agreed that probable cause existed to believe that evidence of criminal violations would likely be found at Mar-a-Lago. Now, this was just a magistrate in Florida. This was not Judge Cannon. It was just a magistrate. They're the ones that usually sign the search warrants. So probable cause was noted. The magistrate judge issued a search warrant for the offices, storage rooms, and potential storage sites of plaintiff's residence and authorized the seizure of, so this is the actual language of the warrant here, which I think is really important. All physical documents and records constituting evidence, contraband, fruits of crime, which is, which is a technical term, or other items illegal, illegally possessed in violation of 18 U.S.C. 793 or 1519 or 2071, including the following. A, any physical documents with classification markings. So any of the three levels of classification was to be included, along with any containers, boxes, including any other contents in which such documents are located, as well as any other containers, boxes that are collectively stored or found together with the aforementioned documents and containers and boxes. Again, this is the language in the warrant, and it continues on to the next page. So B, information including communications in any form regarding the retrieval, storage, or transmission of national defense information or classified materials. And then C, which was not correctly highlighted, sorry. <laughs> any government and or presidential records created between January 20th of 2017 and January 20th of 2021 or any evidence of the knowing alteration, destruction, or concealment of any government and or presidential records or of any documents with classified markings. So this, again, is the language that was in the search warrant. Uh, search warrant, again, they're citing the search warrant. This, the warrant affidavit, so let's, let's not get mixed up first, okay? So we have a grand jury affidavit all right, the grand jury affidavit said, look, turn over all your classified stuff. All right, that wasn't enough. So they went to get the search warrant. All right, search warrant. Now, in order to get a search warrant, you have to have an affidavit, <laughs> okay? You have to have an affidavit supporting probable cause <laughs> in order to get the search warrant, all right? So we have two affidavits involved, so I, I don't want to lose anybody here. <laughs> All right, so that's what they're talking about here. The warrant affidavit described a set of protocols proposed by the government to create a privilege review team. So this was a special group of people that they were putting together in order to take care of the situation. The team was made up of agents who were not otherwise participating in the investigation. They were tasked with reviewing certain seized documents to protect plaintiff's attorney-client privilege. So they were trying to watch out for Trump's attorney-client privilege that was going on. So they had a special team of people just to watch out for those issues. Next, the FBI executed the search warrant on August 8th. Agents seized approximately 13,000 documents and a number of other items, totaling more than 22,000 pages of materials. Despite the certification from Trump that, the, that any and all documents bearing classification markings had been produced, 15 of the 33 seized boxes, containers, or groups of papers contained documents with classification markings, including three such documents found in desks in plaintiff's office. So he had three classified documents in his desk. <laughs> that's it, just in his desk. I don't think that's proper protocol. I'm pausing for a moment, that's very frustrating. <laughs> well, he could, he might have more. All told, the search uncovered over 100 documents marked confidential, top secret, or top secret. Again, these are the three levels of classification. They're all charged equally, so it doesn't matter how which level it's at. You're still charged with the same crime. So they found documents in his desk. <laughs> okay. So next up, plaintiff, so Mr. Trump, 
requested a copy of the warrant affidavit, so the supporting affidavit to show probable cause, an opportunity to inspect the seized property. So he wants to look at the affidavit. He wants to look at the property that was seized and a detailed list of what was taken from his residence and where it was found and consent to the appointment of a special master. All right, so here's his four requests uh, that he's making. So he's asking for a special master to protect the integrity of privileged documents, attorney-client privileged documents. The government denied those requests shortly after the search. A few weeks later, plaintiff filed a new action in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida, which he styled as a motion for judicial oversight and additional relief. So this is where Judge Cannon's going to start being involved, okay? The motion asked the court to, one, appoint a special master, two, enjoin review of the seized materials until a special master was appointed, three, require the United States to supply a more detailed list of the items seized, and four, order the United States to return any item seized that was not within the scope of the search warrant. So he filed a lawsuit in Florida saying, Judge, you need to take a look at this search warrant. I want my stuff back. That's pretty, that's a lot of, uh, I think that takes a lot of guts. Tea break. <laughs> All right. So the motion was a civil filing and did not explain how the district court had jurisdiction to act on all of its requests. It did, however, claim to be a precursor to an eventual motion under Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 41G. That rule permits a person aggrieved by an unlawful search and seizure of property or by the deprivation of property to move for the property's return. So he set out this motion basically saying, I want you to take a look at what happened here because I'm going to file another complaint saying that my rights were violated. Next, the district court could not identify a sufficient jurisdictional basis for the filing, so it requested a jurisdictional brief. So Judge Cannon said, I'm not sure if I've got jurisdiction here. I need you guys to file briefs on it, which is pretty typical and what Judge Chutkin did on the gag order in the DC case, just to give you an idea. All right, so she requested briefs. Days later, plaintiff responded that the district court had equitable and ancillary, ancillary <laughs> jurisdiction, as well as anomalous jurisdiction to enjoin the government and appoint a special master. Uh, he also suggested that Federal Rule of Criminal Proce of Civil Procedure 53 may create an independent cause of action to appoint a special master, but cited no authority for that theory. As for the requested injunction against the United States, plaintiff noted that the law's ambiguity meant that the principles of fairness supported exercising jurisdiction over the entire motion. So this is what he is claiming. The next day, the district court issued an order declaring its preliminary intent to appoint a special master and requiring the government to provide plaintiff with a more detailed list of seized items. So this was her first mistake, all right? A special master is a person who would be um, monitoring the situation. So monitoring the different kinds of documents. It's a specific position that um, you have a person appointed to in order to review what's going on when you've got you know, documents involved like this uh, here. So this was her first mistake. She said she was going to appoint the special master and commanded the government to give a more detailed list of the items that were seized. The court stated that it had jurisdiction pursuant to the court's inherent authority. This phrase is the key here. And Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 53B1, which reads, before appointing a master, the court must give the parties notice and an opportunity to be heard. Any party may suggest candidates for appointment. So she said that she did have jurisdiction under her inherent authority as a judge there, or as the court, the district court there in Florida. After a response from the government that included a description of its privilege filter process, so remember the team that they put together, 
the district court issued a September 5th order directing the appointment of a special master under soon-to-be-developed procedures, so she was going to make special procedures up for the special master, and barring the government from using any seized documents pending resolution of the special master's review process. So all of those uh, tens of thousands of pages of documents that they had seized, she said, you can't look at it. You can't touch that. You can't use that for any further investigation until the special master comes in and takes a look at everything. The order was issued pursuant to the court's equitable jurisdiction and inherent supervisory authority. Again, we're in civil court again. So we're in civil court. We're not in criminal court. She's making a decision that her court has the authority to appoint someone to go in and take a look at the evidence seized by the government through a valid warrant. All right. So you can see how there's going to be some conflicts here. Three days later, the government filed a notice of appeal. It also filed a motion for a partial stay of the injunction. The injunction meaning that they couldn't use the documents so that it could continue using the seized documents bearing classification markings in its criminal investigation. The district court rejected the partial stay on September 15th. So she uh, said, no, I'm not going to allow you to use those records. It also issued an order naming the special master and setting out his specific duties. The government sought a pretrial or a partial stay from this court the next day. So they filed what's known as an interlocutory appeal, and they appealed up to this court, the circuit court, in order to be able to use the documents they had already gathered from their legal search. We granted the stay, concluding that the district court likely had no equitable jurisdiction to issue an order relating to the classified documents. All right, so they're saying, you know what, Judge Cannon, you do not have the authority to issue the kind of order that you set out. So she set out two pieces, right? She set out a special master and the duties of the special master, and she set out the government couldn't use those documents to go further into an investigation. A plaintiff applied for relief to the Supreme Court, but that request was denied. So this was the case where he appealed it up to SCOTUS, up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and said, you know, they shouldn't be able to use any of my stuff. And the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the case. On October 5th, this court approved the government's request for expedited briefing in its appeal of the September 5th order blocking review of the seized documents and directing the appointment of a special master. Now, with the benefit of oral argument, we conclude that the district court lacked jurisdiction to consider plaintiff's initial motion or to issue any orders in response to it. All right, so they said, you don't have jurisdiction, Judge Cannon. You don't have that authority. So here's the analysis, and I'll just go through a little bit. I'm not going to go through all of the elements, uh, but I think it's important to kind of understand because they set out how she screwed up here. So because federal courts lack general jurisdiction, it is to be presumed that a cause lies outside our limited jurisdiction. So they're saying, when in doubt, we don't have jurisdiction, is what they're saying. We review an exercise of equitable jurisdiction for abuse of discretion. So they're saying she abused her discretion, which is our legal term for any time a judge screws up. There was abuse of discretion by saying that she had equitable jurisdiction to even review the case. Uh, here, so only in the narrowest of circumstances permit a district court to invoke equitable jurisdiction. Such decisions must be exercised with caution and restraint as equitable jurisdiction is appropriate only in exceptional cases where equity demands intervention. This is not one of them. So the orange is the holding of the case and the pink is precedent. So this is the law they're relying on. So they're saying there are special circumstances where you can use judicial authority here. You can use equitable jurisdiction, but this is not one of those cases where you can use it. So here's the rule. It's a familiar rule that the courts of equity do not ordinarily restrain criminal prosecutions. So again, that reference to it being in civil court. Can you explain equitable jurisdiction a bit more? I'm confused. Sure, sure. Let's let's take let's go back. Let's go back a little bit here. 
so uh, this is this is the piece here. In order for her to have the ability to do any of the orders that she wrote, she had to have jurisdiction as a federal judge. And the only way that she claimed she had jurisdiction was because of the court's inherent authority. So their inherent authority allows for this kind of, you know, special appointment situation or special jurisdiction. So that's what they're talking about here. There's this inherent ability that a court has to go forward. So when we're talking about equitable jurisdiction, that's what we're talking about. The court's ability to, by its nature, have the ability to go forward to hear a case or to help on a case. But they're saying here, equitable jurisdiction is not appropriate because it needs to be very rarely used. And this was a civil matter talking about a criminal matter. For who you are and what. Oh, thanks, Johnny. I appreciate that. So if that if that helps make sense a little bit more of it. So it's a discretionary thing and it's a discretionary standard. But even with that discretion, there's a test and you have to follow the test. Now, in all law, we have tests for everything. And so that's what the judges are saying here. If there's a four part test she needed to meet. She did not meet the test. So we'll go through that. Yes, that makes sense. Oh, good, good, good. She went above her pay grade. I think she, you know, in making this determination, it's going to be discretionary. And But again, they're saying it's only in exceptional cases where equity demands intervention. So they're saying here in this particular case where he's asking for kind of like uh, special accommodations because he was a former president, that's not going to rise to the level of that unique situation that would be covered under this kind of uh, doctrine. So that's really what they're going into. I see now why there's an argument over whether she made a mistake or was biased. Exactly, Hitch. Exactly. All right, tea break. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at the analysis here. Yes, I'm not sure either yet. I'm not sure either. I think, you know, we'll all have to kind of figure that out as we go through this. So it is a familiar rule that the course of equity do not ordinarily restrain criminal prosecutions. So that's a given. To avoid unnecessary interference with the executive branch's criminal enforcement authority while also offering relief in rare instances where a gross constitutional violation would otherwise leave the subject of a search warrant or of a search without recourse, this circuit has developed an exacting test for exercising equitable jurisdiction over suits flowing from the seizure of property. So we have a test in order to determine equitable jurisdiction. So let's take a look at the test. It's the Ritchie test. We have to look at four factors. Now, anytime we have a test, we look to see if there's an and or an or. Here there's an and, which means all four have to be met. If one fails, then the whole test fails. So number one, whether the government displayed a callous disregard for the individual's interest in, oops, sorry, for the plaintiff's constitutional rights. I skipped a line. All right, so whether the government displayed a callous disregard for the plaintiff's constitutional rights. That's the first question. The constitutional rights here would be the Fourth Amendment, uh, unreasonable searches and seizures. Two, whether the plaintiff has an individual interest in and need for the material whose return he seeks. So does Trump have an individual interest in the material that he wants back? So does he have an interest in all of those tens of thousands of documents that they seized? That's the second part. Number three, whether the plaintiff would be irreparably injured by denial of the return of the property. So if they didn't give him back all of his documents, would he be irreparably harmed? And four, whether the plaintiff has an adequate remedy at law for redress of his grievance. So again, that's another thing. Can they even redress it? Yeah, for real. <laughs> All right, so let's go through this. It's a great analysis, everybody. The plaintiff's jurisdictional brief in the district court dispatched with all four of these inquiries in a single paragraph. Now, that's interesting. So he did the analysis of that four-part test in order to determine if there was a jurisdiction. And he said, yes, all four of them applied to me. <laughs> 
But then the court here says, when we examine plaintiff's arguments about the Ritchie factor, we notice a recurring theme. He makes arguments that if consistently applied would allow any subject of a search warrant to invoke a federal court's equitable jurisdiction. That understanding of Ritchie would make equitable jurisdiction not extraordinary, but instead quite ordinary. So they're saying he's applying the test incorrectly. Our precedent consistently rejects this approach. We've emphasized again and again that equitable jurisdiction exists only in response to the most callous disregard of constitutional rights. And even then, only if other factors make it clear that judicial oversight is absolutely necessary. So now we will go through the elements. And I'll just hit the highlights of the elements here. It's that first element that the court really stakes most of its opinion on. But keep in mind, if any of the four pieces fail, the whole test fails. And jurisdiction is not permitted. So we begin with whether plaintiff has shown a callous disregard for his constitutional rights. Whether this sort of violation has occurred is the foremost consideration for a court when deciding whether it may exercise its equitable jurisdiction in this context. When considering this factor, our precedent emphasizes that the indispensability of an accurate allegation of callous disregard. So that first element, that first prong to the test is the most important here. All right, courts will not intervene in an ongoing investigation, which is what Judge Cannon did here, and rightly so, because the vast majority of subjects of a search warrant have not experienced a callous disregard of their constitutional rights. This factor ensures that equitable jurisdiction remains extraordinary. Otherwise, a flood of disruptive civil litigation would surely follow. This restraint guards against needless judicial intrusion into the course of criminal investigations, a sphere of power committed to the executive branch. The callous disregard standard has not been met here, and no one argues otherwise. The district court, so Judge Cannon's entire reasoning about this factor was that it agrees with the government that at least based on the record to date, there has been not been a compelling showing of callous disregard for plaintiff's constitutional rights. None of the plaintiff's filings here or in the district court contest this finding. Instead, he says callous disregard of his constitutional rights is not indispensable to the test. So rather than saying they are callously disregarding my constitutional rights, which is one of the elements, instead of saying that, he's saying your element is bad. So he's not arguing that he's had a constitutional violation. He's arguing that the test that the court is using is bad. All right. That's a pretty ballsy thing to do. <laughs> in my humble opinion, that is an incorrect, correct reading of our precedent, as well as inconsistent with the longstanding principles outlined above. And the fact that Richie considers three other factors in its test does not suggest otherwise. To the contrary, these factors underscore how rare this exercise of jurisdiction should be. Even a callous disregard of constitutional rights is not enough on its own to allow for the type of relief the plaintiffs seek. So let's bump down here to footnote number two. And it states down at the bottom, plaintiff's lawyers claimed at oral argument that the special master process is necessary to determine whether a constitutional violation happened. This justification finds no support in our precedent and will result in a dramatic and unwarranted expansion of equitable jurisdiction. So what they're saying here is they're saying that Trump wanted a special master so a special master could figure out if there had been constitutional violations rather than claiming that there were constitutional violations, which of course is not how the test work works. As we did in Chapman, we will consider the remaining factors for the sake of completeness. So the first factor has already failed, but they do go into brief descriptions on the rest of the factors. The second Ritchie factor is whether the plaintiff has an individual interest in and need for the materials whose return he seeks. Tea break, one moment. All 
All right, plaintiff's jurisdictional brief mischaracterizes this standard referring to the party's need for the seized materials. He is wrong to suggest that the jurisdiction somehow depends on the balance of interest between the parties. The relevant injury is if he needs the documents. So this is the second factor. Plaintiff has made no such showing. His jurisdictional brief in the district court asserted that the government had improperly seized his passports and that its continued custody of similar material was both unnecessary and likely to cause significant harm. But the passports had already been returned before he filed his first motion, and his jurisdictional brief did not explain what similar materials were at issue or why he needed them. The district court was undeterred by this lack of information. It said that based on the volume and nature of the seized material, the court is satisfied that the plaintiff has an interest in and need for at least a portion of it. Though it cited only the, this is one of my favorite parts, everybody. <laughs> so she cited, Judge Cannon cited only the government's filings <laughs> and <laughs> not the plaintiffs. So <laughs> she's saying because of all of the stuff, there must be something in there that's essential to satisfy that second prong of the test. But that is not enough. Courts, have, courts that have authorized equitable jurisdiction have emphasized the importance of identifying specific documents and explaining the harm from their seizure and retention. And then he's citing case law here. So I'm just going to pause for a moment here. So Judge Cannon said, based on the sheer quantity, there must be something in there that's important. So that would be my first question. Was that a bad decision? Did she make a bad decision by saying that? There's tens of thousands of documents. Somewhere in here must be something that's essential to the plaintiff that he should have back. Did she mess up? I think she did. Yes, she did. Definitely. Okay. No due diligence. Okay. So I think she was wrong. Well, I think that's a great question, though. Do you think that she, rather than saying what documents are you referring to, that she just made this assumption rather than actually doing the work to find it? Yes, yes. If his passport was there, it raises the possibility. Yes, well, the passport was given back. Major mess up. Didn't care to dig deeper. I think that's the exact right answer. I think she needed to go further than what she did. Now, my second question is, does that mean that she screwed up because she just didn't look further and, and she probably should have? And is that due to experience or is that due to her bias? So do you think she made her decision because she hasn't been a judge long enough or she made the decision because she felt, well, he's a former president. There's got to be something important to him in there. So which way does it go? Bias, 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 both, both, bias. Okay. Option B. Okay. Okay. I think it's bias. I think both things can be true. A little bit of both. Sure. Sure. Sure, both. Yeah, I mean, I, you can see, though, how this could go either way, though, this kind of a question. It's a fundamental question. It's a key question here. She made a decision as a judge. She used her discretion. The Court of Appeals said you're wrong. But was she wrong because she was inexperienced or because she was biased? That's the hard question. How do you prove bias? That's a great question. That's a great question. I'm not sure how we would be able to selective blindness or an assumption because he was a former president and, you know, maybe she and because she likes him, like just the assumption was, I'm sure there's something for him in there. Yes, yes. Why not just lazy? And it could very well be lazy. <laughs> it absolutely could be. Absolutely. All right. All right. I think there's just lots of great questions here. All right, so let's hop down to this next one because we get into the Presidential Records Act, which we all know and love, right? 
Indeed, plaintiff does not press the district court's theory on appeal. Instead, he argues that the Presidential Records Act gives him a possessory interest in the seized documents. So he's saying his interest in the documents is because of the Presidential Records Act. That's not a good reading. <laughs> this argument is unresponsive. Even if plaintiff's statutory interpretation were correct, a proposition that we neither consider nor endorse, <laughs> is funny. Uh, personal interest in or ownership of a seized document is not synonymous with the need for its return. So that's really important, right? So, hey, I've got documents and I really like them, but does that really mean you need to have them returned? Again, these were seized legally through a warrant. So let's take a look at footnote number three, my personal favorite footnote. <laughs> During discussion of this factor at oral argument, plaintiff's counsel noted that the seized items included golf shirts and pictures of Celine Dion. <laughs> the government concedes that the plaintiff may have a property interest in his personal effects. While plaintiff may have an interest in these items and others like them, we do not see the need for their immediate return after seizure under a presumptively lawful search warrant. <laughs> I, know. I know. I mean, I don't think that it's necessary for you to get your pictures of Celine Dion back during a criminal investigation. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's required by law, is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And there were, there were personal documents that were involved in personal items. But, you know, that happens when you have a search warrant. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, the court goes on. In most search warrants, you need to ask me, could you slide the paper up? Maybe an inch. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Hold on, everybody. Hold on. Let's see if this is enough. How's this? Wait, am I, am I, is this better? Are we better? He should have given them back. <laughs> Celine, leave Celine out of this. <laughs> That's so funny. Poor Celine, I know, right? Right, okay, great, great, great. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, all right. We have to laugh, people. We have to laugh sometimes, all right? This whole thing is crazy, so we have to laugh. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> In most search warrants, the government seizes property that is unambiguously belongs to the subject of the search. That cannot be enough to support equitable jurisdiction. So that's another piece. <laughs> that's part two. All right. So having failed to show his own need for element number two, Plaintiff attempts, as he did in the district court, to reverse the standard, arguing that the government does not need the non-classified documents for its investigation. This is not self-evident, but it would be irrelevant in any event. Plaintiff's task was to show why he needed the documents, not why the government did not. He has failed to meet his burden under this factor. So factor number two has failed as well. So here we go. Number three, Richie next, next asks whether the plaintiff would be irreparably injured by denial of the return of the property. And again, the district court stepped in with its own reasoning. So here's what Judge Cannon felt. It identified potential irreparable harm that could arise based on one, improper disclosure of sensitive information to the public Two, the United States' retention and potential use of privileged materials. And three, the stigma associated with the threat of future prosecution. So this is what she used as her basis for that third prong. The plaintiff adopted two of the district court's arguments, dedicating a single page in his brief to discussing the first and the third theories of harm. On the first argument, plaintiff echoes the district court and asserts that he faces unquantifiable potential harm by way of improper disclosure of sensitive information to the public. All right. It is not clear whether plaintiff and the district court mean classified information 
or information that's sensitive to the plaintiff personally. If the former, this is one of my favorite parts too, if the former permitting the United States to review classified documents does not suggest that they will be released, any official who makes an improper disclosure of classified materials risks her own criminal liability. That's true. <laughs> What's more, any leak of classified materials would be properly characterized as harm to the United States and its citizens, not as a personal injury to the plaintiff. So he's saying, if you don't give me back my classified documents, it's going to harm me personally. And they're saying, well, I think it actually would harm the United States, <laughs> not you. <laughs> oh my goodness. As for records that may otherwise be sensitive, it cannot be that prosecutors reading unprivileged documents seized pursuant to a lawful warrant constitutes an irreparable injury for the purposes of asserting equitable jurisdiction. So, yeah, no, no reverse. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. Tea break, everybody. <laughs> All right, so here too, plaintiff's argument would apply to nearly every subject of a search warrant. The district court's unsupported conclusion that government possessed of seized evidence creates an unquantifiable risk of public disclosure is not enough to show that plaintiff faces irreparable harm. Similar reasoning guides our approach to the other potential injury identified by the plaintiff, the threat and stigma of future criminal prosecution. No doubt the threat of prosecution can weigh heavily on the mind of anyone under the investigation, but without diminishing the seriousness of the burden that ordinarily, uh, that ordinary experience cannot support extraordinary jurisdiction. So that takes us into our next question then. All right, so she claimed here that the government's possession of the seized evidence creates an unquantifiable risk because there could be public disclosure. That's what Judge Cannon felt. And so she used that to justify the second prong of the test. So the question is, was she right? Would the government's possession of the seized evidence create a risk of public disclosure? That would be the question here. So that's another decision that she had to, that she had to make. She believed it was an extraordinary because of her political bias. That's a, that's a great way of putting it. That's a great way. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. No, no, no. I mean, unquantifiable risk, again, of public disclosure, like what, what is she thinking that's going to be in there that they're going to disclose? That they're somehow going to uh, humiliate, hu be like humiliate him, put something out into the media that they pulled during the, se during the search? She made a decision based on assumed evidence. Seems like a huge error. I agree, I agree, I agree. Yeah, I agree. His photos of Celine Dion, right, right. His colonoscopy of Murray, oh my goodness. No, but seriously, I mean, what could she, what could possibly be in there that would cause this irreparable harm? I think that's a valid question. Either way, <laughs> either way. Yes, either way, the judge said, nope. The court of appeals said, nope, nope. And then the third factor here also weighs against exercising equitable just, uh, jurisdiction. So they don't go into the third factor. So let's hit the last, the fourth and final factor. His true weight. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, everybody. Oh my gosh. All right, all right. The four, here's the fourth piece. Finally, Richie asks whether the plaintiff has an adequate remedy at law for the redress of his grievance. In deciding this factor for the plaintiff, the district court's answer was that he would have no legal means of seeking the return of his property for the time being and no knowledge of when other relief might become available. So this was Judge Cannon's rationale for the fourth prong. This is not sufficient justification. To start, plaintiff uh, invokes Rule 41 in his brief on appeal, but only to say that it has been applied in other cases. 
The only argument that he has plausibly made relating to the rule is for the return of the documents not within the scope of the search warrant. There is no record evidence that the government exceeded the scope of the warrant, which it bears repeating was authorized by a magistrate judge's finding of probable cause. And yet again, plaintiff's argument would apply universally. Presumably, any subject of the search warrant would like all of his property back before the government has a chance to use it. So again, they're saying, look, this happens to everybody with a search warrant. Everybody wants their stuff back, but it doesn't mean that you're special and you get to have your stuff back. Uh, plaintiff's alternate alternative framing of his grievance is that he needs a special master and an injunction to protect documents that he designated as personal under the Presidential Records Act. But as we have said, the status of a document as personal or presidential does not alter the authority of the government to seize it under a warrant supported by probable cause. Search warrants authorize the seizure of personal records as a matter of course. So again, it doesn't matter if it's a personal record or a presidential record, either way, they were covered by the search warrant. Either way. The Department of Justice has the documents because they were seized with a search warrant, not because of their status under the Presidential Records Act. So plaintiff's suggestion that whether the government's entitled to retain some or all of the seized documents has not been determined by any court is incorrect. So that takes us through the four factors, everybody. So one more tea break. <sighs> All right, now this next piece I think is really important. Uh, and then we'll kind of wrap up the holding. All of these arguments are a sideshow. The real question that guides our analysis is this, adequate remedy for what? The answer is the same as it was in the Chapman case. No weight can be assigned to this factor because plaintiff did not assert that any rights had been violated that there has been a callous disregard for his constitutional rights or that a substantial interest in property is jeopardized. If there has been no constitutional violation, much less a serious one, then there is no harm to be remedied in the first place. This factor also weighs against ex exercising equitable jurisdiction. So there's been no finding of any of the four prongs of the test. So. Judge Cannon said she had the authority to issue the rulings because of her innate authority under equitable jurisdictional grounds. The court said, according to the test that we used, you don't. None of the Ritchie factors favor exercising equitable jurisdiction over this case. The plaintiff, however, asked us to refashion our analysis in a way that, if consistently applied, would make equitable jurisdiction available for every subject of every search warrant. He asks us to ignore our precedents, finding that a callous disregard for constitutional rights is indispensable. He asks us to conclude that a property interest in a seized item is sufficient need for its immediate return. He asks us to treat any stigma arising from the government's access to sensitive personal information or the threat of potential prosecution as irreparable injuries. And he asks us to find that he has no other remedy apart from equitable jurisdiction, even though he faces no remedial harm. Anyone could make these arguments and accepting them would upend Ritchie, requiring federal courts to oversee routine criminal investigations beyond their constitutionally ascribed role of approving a search warrant based on a showing of probable cause. Our precedents do not allow this and neither does our constitutional structure. Only one possible justification for equitable jurisdiction remains, that the plaintiff is a former president of the United States. It is indeed extraordinary for a warrant to be executed at the home of a former president, but not in a way that affects our legal analysis or otherwise gives the judiciary license to interfere in an ongoing investigation. The Ritchie test has been in place for nearly 50 years. It limits apply no matter who the government is investigating. 
to create a special exception here would defy our nation's foundational principle that our law applies to all without regard to numbers, wealth, or rank. The law is clear. We cannot write a rule that allows any subject of a search warrant to block government investigations after the execution of a warrant, nor can we write a rule that allows only former presidents to do so. Either approach would be a radical reordering of our case law, limiting the federal court's involvement in criminal investigations, and both would violate bedrock separation of powers limitations. Accordingly, we agree with the government that the district court improperly exercised equitable jurisdiction and that dismissal of the entire proceeding is required. The district court improperly exercised equitable jurisdiction in this case. For that reason, we vacate the September 5th order on appeal and remand with instructions for the district court to dismiss the underlying civil action. So there we have it. Your, uh, my mods are fantastic, Brian. You're absolutely right. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So, so there we have it, everybody. What, what are our thoughts then? What are our thoughts on Judge Cannon at this point? So this is the case that she was, review, was reversed on. The decision she made in this case to exercise her discretion was overruled and the case was dismissed. But what are our thoughts then? Recusal, recusal, recusal. No other ex-president. Right. Right. So compromised. Okay. Okay. It was just inexperienced and not biased. Why do all the mistakes go one party's way? That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. So then if we're looking for recusal, we've got mandatory recusal if there's a conflict of interest or if there's some kind of bias. So that could be here or a request for recusal from either party. So then my question is, do you think that Jack Smith should request that she recuse herself? Where has she ruled against Trump? Well, let's, she needs to go, okay, okay. Yes, yes, request it, request it, 100%, 100%. Okay, okay. So our thoughts are that he should request. Okay, so with that, let me show you then, uh, just as examples, I'm not gonna read through these documents, uh, but let me show you here what happened in DC, okay? So in DC, uh, Mr. Trump put in a motion for recusal under this section of the code, okay? Uh, recusal of Judge Chutkin. So let me get this in frame here. I don't know if there's enough evidence against her. Yeah, I agree, I agree, but she should go. <laughs> well, we gotta have evidence. We gotta have enough evidence. Not request, maybe appeal if he loses. Yes, yes, I think so, absolutely. Absolutely. So again, let's take a peek. I've read through all of these on multiple lives, but let's just take a peek again. So we have, um, this is the DC case, all right? District of Columbia. The defendant here filed a motion for recusal. So here's, I, I'll just put this in uh, just very short explanation here. So Judge Chutkin has in connection with other cases suggested that President Trump should be prosecuted and imprisoned. Such statements made before this case began and with due process are inherently disqualifying. Although Judge Chutkin may genuinely intend to give President Trump a fair trial and may believe that she can do so, her public statements unavoidably taint these proceedings regardless of the outcome. So he's saying Judge Chutkin's statements about him going to jail show that she's biased and she should recuse herself. So my question is, uh, you know, again, put in here and, you know, the government came back and said that's not quite true. But that's that's the basis that he is trying. He was asking Judge Chutkin to remove herself from the situation. So his motion for a recusal was set up in that way. Should recuse herself from this case and direct the clerk to randomly assign this matter to another district judge. Additionally, given the overriding public interest in ensuring the appearance of fairness in the proceeding, President Trump requests the court consider this motion as an expedited basis pending resolution. 
Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Of course. So here was his request. So he's requesting Judge Chuck can recuse herself. Here's the exhibits that he's listed. The first one is a transcript of the sentencing of one of the January 6th defendants, right? We've kind of talked about this before. So she used language in here that specifically stated um, that at this point in the sentencing, that if we were going to take your participation out of the group, that everything would have still happened. Your actions did not materially con uh, contribute. So she goes on and basically saying here that it was because of one man that you came here. So that was one of his exhibits. Here's the next exhibit. This was a uh, motion for recusal. Again, exhibit B. So he put in the transcript of a sentencing hearing again for one of the defendants for January 6th. And within the sentencing order, she said here, um, let's see. Uh, let's just make sure. She went through criminal history. Okay, he went to the Capitol because despite election results in which clear cut, despite the fact that multiple court challenges all over the country had rejected every single one of the challenges, Mr. Palmer didn't like the result. He didn't like the results and he didn't want the transition of power to take place because his guy lost. And it's true, Mr. Palmer, that you've made a very good point, one that has been made before, that the people who exhorted you and encouraged you and rallied you to go and take action and to fight have not been charged. So those were the basis for Mr. Trump saying she needed to recuse herself because she was biased. So do we have a bias here based off of what she said during the sentencing? That's the question. Now, the answer comes in two different forms. First, we have the brief here. All right, so to get some insight into, nope, 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 okay. One of the biggest pieces that the government argued was that it's part of her job as a, as a judge to make those kinds of conclusions and make use those that kind of language in sentencing, which they're absolutely right. So Jack filed this brief supporting that she does not be, that she's not recused. So let's take a look just at his very, first bit. There's no valid basis under the relevant law and facts for the Honorable Chutkin to disqualify herself in this proceeding. In service of the motion seeking the court's recusal, defendant both takes out of context the court's words from prior judicial proceedings and misstates the proper legal standard governing judicial recusals. So we're cherry picking from different portions of the sentencing orders here. Also, the defendant attempts to apply the wrong recusal standard to the court statements, whereas here the recusal motions based on the statement by a judge during allegations must provide clear and convincing evidence which a court should scrutinize with care. So here's the standard. A judge, once having drawn a case, should not recuse himself on an unsupported, irrational, or highly tenuous speculation where he or she to do so, the price of maintaining the purity of appearance would be the power of litigants or third parties to exercise a negative veto over the assignment of judges. So this is the rationale that Jack used in order to support Judge Chutkin staying on the trial in D.C. Okay? So that's the standard he would use again. So if he was to apply this to Judge Cannon, this rule here should not recuse herself on unsupported, irrational, or highly tenuous speculation. So is that what's at play with Judge Cannon in Florida? That's the question. Do we have evidence that's supported, that's rational, and is not highly speculative that she's biased? Do we have evidence of that based off of her orders that she's done, based off of her rulings in the case? That's the question. You don't think she's reached that? No, no. Yes? Yes, no. No, there's not enough evidence from what you've seen. Not enough evidence. No, you don't think so. Okay, okay. Not enough. It's just speculative. I don't think so. No, no, no. Okay, yes and no and yes. <laughs> okay, so we're kind of split. We're split on it. We're, we're not sure if there's enough evidence. Now, when we've taken a look at her orders, and I've kind of gone through that docket multiple times in Florida, just to give you a heads up on that, um, you know, she has 
uh, she put off the Garcia hearing, so the conflict of interest hearing. She told both parties to not file uh, frivolous motions. She's uh, pushed discovery. She's pushed different uh, pieces down the road. She's kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit. She has set trial, but has moved some of the dates regarding uh, reviewing classified documents. Those seem to be the biggest complaints right now, is this kind of idea that she's delaying things or dragging things on. That seems to be the number one complaint about what she's doing. So she's not negatively impacting. It's not like she's ruling on motions in limine and saying, government, you can't have any of your evidence. She's not at that point yet, like, and we could get there, but she's not there yet. So the evidence that we have seems pretty slim. She doesn't know what she's doing. True. I think that's true. But not knowing what you're doing is not grounds to pull someone from a case. Although it should be. <laughs> Although it really should be. It really should be grounds. <laughs> Literally tried to. Yes, her actions are suspect but not conclusive. That's a really great way of saying that. Yeah, seriously, I agree. I know, I know. <laughs> that's a shame. <laughs> No, it really is, everybody. <laughs> it really is. She knows exactly what she's doing. Perhaps, perhaps she does. Ask for a recusal. Yes, he can request a recusal. He absolutely can. But based off of his response in the Judge Chutkin recusal motion, it's going to take a lot for him to make that request. It's going to take a lot of evidence. Why does she not know what she's doing? Just saying these things have more experience. I, I think it was, again, it was just the luck of the draw or the bad luck. I feel like she's in a passive aggressive against, and that could be, and that could be, but that's not necessarily rising to the level of disqualifying her, having that kind of a bias. It would be a bad look for them to ask for a recusal at this stage. You know, Hitch, that's a really good point. The longer a case goes on, the harder it is to ask a judge for a recusal. Absolutely. The other thing too, everybody, to keep in mind, the other piece is that we did have, she's been with this case from the beginning. She has been involved in this case since August 22nd of 2022. So although she was the one that was given the draw for the case in the Florida case, for the Florida documents case, she's actually been a part of this since the very beginning, since that original magistrate warrant was set out. So there are some things that can be beneficial from having the same judge that's been involved this long in the case. Is doing things correctly 50% of the time just by doing things wrong the other 50% of the time? That's a great question. I think that's an absolutely valid question. Absolutely valid question. And judges screw up. They screw up a lot, especially new judges. But... Again, I mean, unless it's an egregious mistake that people are making, uh, that judges are making, you know, we just kind of roll with the punches. The case isn't over. They may be driving a case to get her thrown off the bench. Could be. What's the point of having a judge if the president can throw out their ruling? Um, what? Kristen, what are you talking about? <laughs> She'd probably give him probation. True, true. So what's the answer? I don't have it, Chris. I don't have the answer. I do not have the answer, everybody. I would say at this point, there's not enough evidence to ask for a recusal in this case. And at the point at which there would be enough, it would be so blatantly obvious that without a doubt, Jack would be first hitting an interlocutory appeal. That would be the first step. If she makes a ruling that is completely out of line, he would appeal it. And then second would ask for that recusal. Need more evidence. Yeah, I agree. I agree. How does she get involved in with both? It's possible, yeah. I mean, again, it's just kind of luck of the draw here. Side doesn't like her decisions. Now they want recusal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. That's exactly what happened in D.C. So uh, here's, here's Judge Chutkin's response, right? So we've been talking about that. We had that motion for a recusal. And she does a really good job of outlining here. So here in her last piece, it states, by contrast, this court has from the beginning repeated its commitment to ensure the orderly administration of justice in this case, as in any other case. That commitment echoes the court's solemn oath to administer justice without respect to persons. 
to do equal right to the poor and to the rich and to faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all duties under the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Based on its review of the law, facts, and record, the court concludes that a reasonable observer would no doubt, would not doubt its ability to uphold that promise in this case. So Judge Cannon took this same oath. She is still, she also has to uphold justice and ensure orderly administration of justice. So the question is, is she upholding her oath as a judge? Is she doing her job as a judge? Or is she so incompetent that we toss all of her cases? So her entire caseload gets tossed due to incompetence. But the only way to gain competence is through experience. So that's the question. Is this a normal speed of movement in the case? I think so. Actually, I was surprised at the date she set for trial. That seemed quick to me. That seemed very quick. How can it be proven a judge is biased? It's very difficult. It's it's difficult. Uh, you, It is possible, but it, it has to be pretty blatant. It does happen. Hasn't asked for a recusal in the Florida case. This one, this is for uh, Judge Chutkin out of the District of Columbia. Rookie pitcher on the mound for the rule. Oh my gosh, knock. That's exactly right. A rookie pitcher on the mound for the World Series. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's perfectly put. Yeah, you got it. So it doesn't mean necessarily that there's grounds to pull her. It just means it's going to be ugly. <laughs> it's going to be ugly. It's going to be an ugly situation. <laughs> in Florida, is it normal? Okay, so Lisa, they've, they've got what they call the rocket docket in Florida, right? Because they're so quick. Their turnover is very quick in Florida. I'm not sure that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is quick. That was the explanation for why it was set so quickly in Florida. So I don't think necessarily that it's dragging on too long. I... Personally, what bothered me was her handling of the Garcia hearings. That bothered me. That, to me, really illustrated her inexperience level. But as for pushing things down the road, we're seeing it in D.C. We're seeing Trump requesting it constantly and kind of being 50% of the time making it, 50% of the time not making it. So I, I don't see this that much difference in Florida as in D.C. at this point. But again, you know, there's a lot of time left. There's a lot of time. How about the paperless motions? You know, that's a really good point. So here's what happened, everybody. Let me just share this with you. I'm glad you brought that up. So I was going through this docket. This is the docket for the civil case. All right. So the civil case. What happened at the Garcia hearing? Well, she she got so frustrated, she canceled the second hearing and then forgot about the press's motion. So I just feel like she could have handled that better for something that was scheduled all right so like yeah yeah i and i'm not sure so so let me just show you this as i was going through this docket this was a civil case okay so we're back in 2020 i was looking through this and as you can anything that's highlighted in pink is something from the court so I was going through this all the way back in August. And look at this. We have a paperless order, paperless order, paperless order, paperless order. And I kept thinking, oh, well, maybe this is just what they do. Maybe this is just how they do things there in Florida. Because there's all of these paperless orders. All of this way before. And then I looked and I noted they're all signed by Judge Cannon. I think, here's my conclusion, everybody, based off of this just very rudimentary understanding, I think this is just her style. I think this is just what she does. I'm not sure this is particular to this particular case because over and over and over again, again, I, you know, 18 months before any of this came to fruition, we have all of these paperless orders, paperless minute entries, paperless orders, so I don't have any of her other documents or any of her other dockets, but look at all of her orders here are paperless. Even the one dismissing the case because of the Court of Appeals, they're all paperless. I don't think they necessarily hurt an appeal, but there has been a point made on, uh, you know, a paperless order is something that's kind of like the way of quick and dirty of dealing with, uh, it's more of like a, 
a, an ER situation as opposed to going to a doctor's office and getting a full report. So it's still valid. It's just not as thorough as you would get if you have a full written order. Lazy again. That's a good question. That's a good question. Or that she's green. I'm wondering. I'm wondering if she is just, you know, her docket is so full that she's trying to keep all the balls in the air, so to speak. And so in order to get done what she needs to get done, she does paperless orders because it's quicker. It's a quicker way of getting it processed. Can they ask her to leave? Thank you. Yes, yes. So use it when they don't. Yeah, less than green. She's still yellow. <laughs> That's funny. She doesn't want a paper trail. Could be. It could be. You know, I mean, that's possible. But for me, I thought it was kind of a moment when I looked through and I said, wow, this must just be how Florida does it with all these paperless orders. But then when I took a look to see that it was uh, the same judge, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, I think this is just the style of this judge. Not unusual in Florida. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering about that. I mean, I don't think anybody even questions it. So it must be just very common practice there. You know, it certainly isn't common practice in my jurisdiction, but my jurisdiction is very different than uh, the federal jurisdiction in Florida. Do other judges do this? They do. I haven't seen it this much, but I also, honestly, I don't practice in federal court. I mean, I've, I've dealt in federal court a few times, but I've not dealt with it at a point where I could assess whether or not all judges do this or not. Judge Chutkin has put out a few paperless orders, but none to the same degree as this, especially in a case of this magnitude. But, you know, this could just be her style. And she may think like, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And, you know, Judge Chutkin may be making an extra effort because she realizes how important the case is. And, you know, maybe Judge Cannon's like, again, I don't care. I'm a busy woman. I got stuff to do. So I'm going to just put my order out. Can we look up a different one of her cases? Absolutely, you certainly can. I have not, uh, but you could um, do a search and pull up uh, any of her other cases. She's not had, I think she's only had a handful of cases at this level, but you know, if, if you take a look, uh, you, could, you could see some of her bigger cases would have a lot of these kinds of orders in them, and you could see if they were paperless or not. Would it be biased that there's communication between Cannon and Trump? Uh, great question. That would be illegal, actually. Or you would have to have something called an ex parte discussion. So because he's one of the parties involved in a case that she's involved in, they can have ex parte communications, but they have to do it properly. If not, the government always has to be called. The government should always be involved in everything unless uh, procedures are followed for an ex parte discussion looking for a pattern. I think that's a great idea. I think that's an excellent idea to take a look at some of her other cases. I haven't, but she hasn't had many. She just got the job three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. She does. She doesn't have a lot. I think though, you can probably see, you know, what her propensity is based on some of her past cases. I think that's, you know, worth looking it up. Send an order decision fee email first and then official soon after. Yes, and that seems to be how a lot of judges do it. And that's how Judge Chuckhead seems to do it, that there will be a minute entry done and then followed up with a full order. But here, we just have these paperless orders, and there's a lot of them. You know, I, again, though, I'm not in Florida, so I'm not sure if this is normal or not. Is that why her, her limits her responses to 200 words? That's a great question, too. Could be. Could be. Where would you find them? So you can go online, and you can search up uh, I would probably use, um, probably search, let's see, I would put in um, Aileen Cannon uh, here, and I would put in a different terms like uh, just dockets. I would look for her dockets. I would look up um, court opinions, uh, and that should lead you down the rabbit hole. Any of these search terms would do that or court orders. So if you're kind of Googling or, you know, whatever search engine of your choice, if you put in her name and then you put in one of these search terms at a time, you should be able to pull up a few different 
um, dockets that she's got. It just depends on what's up and available in your area. What exactly is a paperless order? Well, it is just that. It is just um, an order that's put into the file here. So, for example, here's one. Uh, granting 33 defendants unopposed motion to exceed page li the page limit for defendants' response is hereby enlarged from 20 to 40 pages signed by the judge. So rather than having a, an order, so a document we would print out that would have a full order listed on it. So let me give you an example of what a full order looks like. So like this is Judge Chutkin's order. So she has filed document number 61 filed it here, here's the pages, and then set out a full explanation. As opposed to the paperless order, where we're now going to refer to this as number 34, filed August 29th, the only thing you have is this little blip. So rather than having this full paper order, we just have this little blip. And now, sometimes you can do just a one-page order. That happens all the time. But rather than even doing a one-page order, it's just this little notation. So it's noted on the docket as number 34. So there's a citation to it. But it's literally just a sentence signed by the judge. Off to bed you go, Deb. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for visiting. Yay! <laughs> Always good to see you. She doesn't want to be held accountable for detail. It could be. It could very well be. I do not know her motivation behind it. I do not know. Uh, but, you know, I think there, there are some good questions. They're valid questions to ask, I think. Is it normal for a judge not wanting to hear a defendant? No, it's very normal, Paul. Every day, every day, 100,000 times in a day, the judge will tell a defendant they don't want to hear it. <laughs> In fact, probably 20 times this morning in my own courtroom, they're like, I don't want to hear it. We have to say that. They have to say that to, to the defendants all the time because defendants just want to go blah, 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 blah. And we have to cut them off because there's rules. You can't just go all, you know, Harry Carey in court and say whatever you want. There are rules. <laughs> we have to follow them. Tiffany, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, you know. Could it come back to haunt her? I don't think so. I don't think so. I say document 61. Does that mean 61 for the month of the year? That literally is the numbering system of what the, the document is in the system. So for this case, here's our case number here. So all the way to the side they will have. So the complaint is document number one. And if you flip through, uh, if you want to know what this summons is, then it's document 32. So it is literally each document that's submitted to court or entry is given a number. So even though there's not literally a paper for the paperless order, it's given an entry number. Literally stop people from incriminating themselves. They do. They have to. <laughs> they have to. Because they talk. You know, they just talk so much. And... I understand. I understand. I I was in court once and there was a guy and it was, you know, it was a minor offense, but he just was like, look, let me just explain to you what happened. And the judge is like, dude, we're going to set it for trial. Do you want to set it for trial? You want to plead guilty or not guilty? We're here for a plea. We're not here for, you know, the trial. We're not here for trial. That's a different day. He's like, well, let me just tell you what happened. And so all of us in the courtroom that are all waiting, we're just like, oh my gosh, please stop talking. It's a lot. <laughs> They do. They love to tell their side and that's fine. But there's a time and a place and a manner and everything is so highly regulated in court. <laughs> we have to watch the rules. Uh. Yes, it, it, it looks like she does a lot of paperless orders. Again, I don't have much to compare it to, so I really don't know. But it looks like a lot. It looks like a lot. Do they have a right to prove their innocence? Paul, they have a right, but you have to follow the rules. So let me just show you here. Here are the rules, okay? There's criminal procedure rules. There's rules of civil procedure. There's rules of evidence. You have to follow the rules. So all of your evidence in proving your innocence, you have to follow the procedural rules. The rules have to be followed. You can't just say blah, 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 and be like, okay, I'm done. I've proven my case beyond a reasonable doubt. Woohoo, I win. You can't do that. You got to follow the rules, man. The rules. <laughs> There's got to be... You got to follow the rules. <laughs> we got to do that. How they know. <laughs> Does not seem to be very thorough. Quinn, I think that's an excellent point. That's exactly it. It's not very thorough. It's kind of, it's quick and dirty. It's like triage, you know, it's not, uh, not particularly, um, 
He rules. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. And a lot of people do. And you get you can get tripped up in the rules. If you don't know the rules of evidence and you're trying to present a whole bunch of stuff, uh, you know, and you're not following the rules, the judge is like, no, you can't just stop talking. You can't, no. <laughs> What's the green book? So the green book, <laughs> these are all federal rules, everybody. Your states all have their own sets of rules here. The green book is the rules of civil procedure. And as you can see, it's quite a bit thicker <laughs> than all of the other books. We got a lot. We got a lot. <laughs> Legal ballet. I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah. You know, we've got substantive law, which is, you know, what the statute says. And then we have procedural law, which is how you take your case to court. So I would always tell my students, substantive law is the burrito, but how you eat the burrito is procedural law. So you can't just pick the burrito up and eat it. You got to follow the rules. <laughs> that's how you do it. Common law is case law. And that means precedent. We rely on that. So, yes, that also is substantive law as well. Exactly. You got it. Exactly. Yes. She shows a level of disinterest. You know, that could be a good point, too. That could be a good point. She might. She might want to get the book. Well, uh, they're all available. Um, you know, not everybody, you don't always need the books. They're all available for free online if you want. They're easier for me. Uh, they're more portable. So that's why I like to get... Um, the small, these small copies. I've got larger ones of my state. My state rules are bigger, uh, but those editions come out every other year. So I have those for my state as well. But I think it's best to just use the federal rules when I'm teaching. So it's easier. You've got the 1986 version. That's nice. We love that. When I eat the burrito, it goes everywhere. Exactly. So you got to have the rules. You got to, first of all, you got to make sure that the burrito is on the plate correctly. <laughs> And then you got to figure out the rules for how you're going to eat the burrito. Legal etiquette. Yeah, exactly, Michelle. You got it. <laughs> I object to fish tacos. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, does it have to be a burrito? No, it doesn't have to be a burrito. It can be anything. It can be anything at all, Kristen. Whatever it is. <laughs> but that's the substantive, that's the substantive law. So your constitution, your statutes, your common law or your case law, that's your, you know, main course. But which fork you use and how you eat it, those are all of our procedural rules. Both are needed in order to eat. <laughs> you have to have both. Street tacos, <laughs> what about a bowl? You name it, whatever food you want, everybody. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, whatever food you want, but you got to eat it in a certain way. Fork, spoon, knife, whatever. <laughs> A spatula. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, who uses a fork these days? Great question. <laughs> That's true for a street taco, but still, you know, I mean, how, how do you pick the street taco up? Like, those are all specific rules. Which hand do you use? Which way do you use it? So, jambalaya. <laughs> I want tacos too. <laughs> yes, yes. But how do you start with the ribs, right? Which end do you start with? You know, do you put sauce on it first? Again, those are your rules of evidence. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness no chopsticks well sometimes chopsticks are required <laughs> no don't tell a judge that they don't like that <laughs> you don't eat burritos with the fork okay 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 <laughs> and no pineapple on pizza i get it i get it <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> let's use judge judy for the trial <laughs> oh my goodness Oh my goodness. Yes, lots of napkins, everybody. Lots of napkins. Very important. I ate a pizza with fork and a knife and got rid of Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> We're getting too technical. Yes, the the technical rules are a lot. They really are a lot, everybody. <laughs> I object to find a little piece. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> the tea break. <laughs> so funny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's fine. No, not the pineapple on pizza debate. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, perhaps, perhaps. So I do not know everybody. Bottom line, I do not know what's going to happen <laughs> with Judge Cannon. But, you know, now it gives you some insight. How did she actually screw up? What was her reasoning? We don't really know. But it gives you the insight into what's really going to be going on. I like to present 
said the fork and the burrito. Well, you can appeal. That's the thing, everybody. If you don't use the fork correctly, then the other side's going to appeal and say, you screwed up the fork. And so we want a new burrito. <laughs> and that's a pain in the keister. <laughs> Yes, that's a technical term for it. <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Okay, okay. <laughs> so let me just do two closing, closing statements, everybody. <laughs> I'm not guilty, but here's what happened. <laughs> oh my gosh, every day, every day. All right, so we, we don't have much. I need to add on the new changes to the calendar out of the DC case. Uh, we've got a few things that have moved, but other than that, we really don't have too much going on. Um, I'm not sure exactly what we will do tomorrow. I really would like, I know right now the uh, TikTok ban, again, is kind of up for debate. We have a ruling already on this idea of trying to ban TikTok, and it was a case called TikTok v. Trump, in which the court said, no, that's a violation of the First Amendment. So we already have precedent on it, uh, on this attempt to ban it. So I think this case would be really great. So I think I'd like to try to go through this case with everybody tomorrow. So that'll kind of be our Friday uh, discussion so that you at least know we've got case law already when it comes to a TikTok ban. And so this is the case law that's been set. So I think that would be very helpful. So we'll do that tomorrow. Um, that's what I've got set for then. Other than that, I really don't have um, too much set on our on our live docket. <laughs> now there's a hearing for that motion for summary judgment appeal. So in New York, right? So like 90% of that case was already decided on a motion for summary judgment by Judge Engeron. Now Trump appealed that. The hearing regarding that appeal on that summary judgment is on Monday. So that will be a big deal. That should be very interesting. Yes, I agree, Angela. I'm with you. Like, I just don't trust the other apps. I just don't. I have trust issues. I appreciate you so much. Always learn so much. Yes. Oh, of course. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Absolutely. So um, what I would like to do, everybody, we did a sub chat on Wednesday. Um, and that, that was really fun. So I would like to do another sub chat once a week. But I'm thinking I may change the sub chat to uh, a Sunday, but I'm wanting to know if that would work out okay for everybody or not. So I'm thinking the sub chat would be Sunday night and we would just kind of do, I like to do kind of a preview of what's going on in the week. So yes, yes, okay, yes, it would. Anything on Colorado? Not yet. No, I've not heard back from Colorado yet. I, anytime we should hear back. Yeah, anytime we should hear back from Colorado. Okay, that works. That's work. Okay, excellent. So we will plan then a sub chat on Sunday the 12th. Um, and then I will be doing my YouTube live on Wednesdays then. So I think that's probably how I'll plan that out. Now, what I think I'm going to start doing is taking, uh, doing two days on and one day off. Um, I think that'll probably be best for my voice. So we'll see how that goes. You like weekdays? Okay. Okay. Can unsubs watch? Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. It's just kind of a bonus uh, that I'm putting in. Defense witnesses for New York. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what order they're going to start doing uh, the defense. And I'm not sure exactly if um, what we're going to see from the state for their official resting. So we'll be watch, we'll be uh, watching for that. Any day works. Okay, okay. Okay. Nothing on Georgia regarding Floyd's. No, not yet. We haven't heard anything back in Georgia other than um, Clark's motion for a moving discovery dates. So that's still going on. I agree. Yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Let's see. So I'm doing okay. So I think tomorrow I will do a, um, we'll go through the TikTok case. This will just be a case review. So it probably will be a short live. Uh, so it'll probably just be an hour. 
um, but we'll just review the TikTok case and then I'll be back again for sub chat on Sunday. So that should give me plenty of time to rest. My voice, I probably will start taking um, probably Tuesdays off, Tuesdays and Saturdays uh, in order to rest my voice. So I think that will probably work best. So that's kind of my tentative schedule. I should do another live with Hawk. He's kind of busy right now. He's got he's got some stuff going on in his world, which I think is great. So I'm kind of waiting for his busy period to pass a little bit. But I will definitely <laughs> will definitely need to do that. I need to um yeah, so the TikTok case, yeah. So this is uh, TikTok v. Trump. This was when there was uh, a mandatory ban temporarily or an attempt to ban TikTok. And the court said, well, that's not legal under the First Amendment. So this is the precedent. So anytime any discussion of the TikTok ban comes up again in Congress, I always look at the case law here because we have a case setting precedent and Congress needs to comply with that. The only way they could do it is if they put a law in that would satisfy the burden that the court sets out in this case, and that would be very difficult. Yep, so this is the case. If if anyone wants to pull it uh, to hang out, we'll go through this case tomorrow. I won't be reading this case as much as I'll be just walking you through the case, so it'll kind of be a shorter live, but it's 507 F SUP 3rd 92, and this was decided in 2020. So that will be the case that we go through. Lawfare, really? Website has the same schedule? Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fun. You know, I've enjoyed uh, the Lawfare website, I have to say. I go and pop on there every once in a while and go looking around. They, that's a really great website. I've enjoyed that. Precedent schmessident. <laughs> it's so true. Oh, it's true. It's true. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go ahead and sign off, everybody, for tonight. It's time for me to say my farewells. <laughs> but it was so fun hanging out with everybody tonight and kind of asking these great questions. What's going to happen? We don't really know, <laughs> but we'll do our best as we go through it. So I will be back again tomorrow. We'll do a short one uh, going through that TikTok case. Uh, yeah, so Sunday would be my same, my normal time. So 7 o'clock. Uh, central. So yes, thank you so much to all of the moderators. As always, I'm so thankful for your time. Uh, and thank you everybody for coming and hanging out with me. Always fun. Uh, there's a lot of great information to kind of gather tonight. So I'll be back again tomorrow, uh, same time. And I will see, turn off the comments. <laughs> well, I might, I might, Kristen. <laughs> I'll see you all tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming by. <laughs>